I thought I wanted to be a doctor, but then I got to the US and there were so many things there that I actually wasn't enjoying it as much as I thought I was going to enjoy it. Marlene, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Farai. Thanks for having me here. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this, sparing your time with us. That means a lot, hey? So you are a software developer currently. Uh, in your, what does your current, what does a day in your life look like right now? Right, so I am a software engineer, but right now I'm working as a developer advocate. Yeah. So what that means is I basically, half of my job is software engineering and the other half is like communications related, people related, community related. So. Um, for me, that looks like a lot of my day is, some of my day is spent writing code, uh, or I would say some of my week is spent writing code. So yeah. I will probably choose like some days in the week to, um, focus on writing code. And then the other parts of my day or different seasons are like focused on either writing content or giving a talk or um, you know, writing blog posts or improving documentation. Yeah. So for me, it's kind of like a balance. I just came out of like a very long conference season where I was traveling a lot for yeah. to speak at conferences. So yeah, it kind of varies day by day, <laughs> but it's just a mixture of code, writing code and software engineering with communication related things. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Your educational background is quite interesting to me because um, you you studied molecular biology, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm, but now right. you're like in software engineering. Um, yes. How did that transition happen? So it was such a it was like it's such a very it's a long story and it's like <laughs> so difficult, I guess, to explain in terms of. There were so many things that I think led me to where I am right now. Yeah. But I started off, like I, you mentioned, I was studying molecular biology. I thought I wanted to be a doctor. Yeah. You know, in Zimbabwe, I feel like, <laughs> you know, there are four professions and a doctor is one of it's them. Is one of them, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> so I was, you know, I, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, but then I got to the US and there were so many things there that I actually wasn't enjoying it as much as I thought I was going to enjoy it. Um, there were a lot of other implications as well about studying medicine in the U.S. because it's so much more expensive and it's so yeah. much longer, the processes, than anywhere else in the world. So I was yeah. just like, okay, this is a lot. <laughs> and then for a bunch of different reasons, I came home one summer and I was home and just trying to figure out and navigate, you know, what do I actually want to do with my life? And just spent a lot of time kind of like, you know, searching and praying about like, okay, what, are, what, what do I actually want to do? Yeah. And out of that, I felt like I wanted to help girls in our community here in Zim. I wanted to empower them with skills that would help them and just in general. And so ultimately I ended up starting a nonprofit and as part of that nonprofit, I then went on to be like, okay, what skills can we give people that are going to help them? Yeah. And coding was one of those skills. And I had only learned about coding when I was in the U S studying because my roommate, that was like the first time I really got a concept of coding was when my roommate, she started out as a math major. Yeah. And then she changed to be a, um, a, a software engineering major. Yeah. And in that change, she really like was enjoying it. And she was like trying to build like, you know, I remember she built this app that looked for the, the warmest way to get from one place <laughs> to another on campus yeah. <laughs> because we were both international students. And so just seeing the power that code can actually give people was a big part of that for me. So I started teaching, trying to, I acted at the time, actually, I didn't know how to code at all, yeah. but I was like, I want to create a space for girls to learn how to code and give them that opportunity. So I partnered with someone that was already doing those sorts of things, Django Girl Workshops in Harare. Yeah. And he also, so he started teaching the girls. I was just organizing and behind the scenes, making everything 
um, hopefully go smoothly. <laughs> and during that process was when I actually then started to teach myself how to code in Python, started getting really involved in the community, both locally and internationally. Yeah. And, and uh, went for context, uh, yeah. when was this, like, time period-wise? So this was like around 2016, I think, is when this all f when I started this nonprofit. Yeah. And so it was a couple of years ago, I guess, and yeah, and so I've been Ooh, in the industry like, ever rapidly. since then. Exactly, yeah. it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, that's really interesting because I only got to to meet you in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, mm. and by then. Um, within the context of Zim at least, uh, you had already become uh, this larger than life figure <laughs> who was like wow. um, working on things that are like so impactful, right? Um, mm. And that's fascinating because it ties into something um, you've said before. I don't remember if it was an interview or I saw this on your LinkedIn, but what you said was, um, whilst tech might not be perfect, um, Unlike most fields, uh, there are ways that you can bypass traditional gatekeepers and still be successful. Um, 100%. Please, can you like explain that a bit more, the concept of bypassing traditional gatekeepers? Yeah, so I think tech is such an amazing field because you don't need a degree. And there's so many people in tech that I, like I started my first job in tech without having, you know, any, like any degree to experience, you know, yeah. and I was working at NVIDIA, <laughs> honestly, <Yeah. laughs> with when I was still in school. And like, I feel like I was still very early on in, in studying at computer science because I had just decided to transition and just decided to go back to school for computer science. Yeah. And like still being able to have those opportunity to work for big companies without a degree is I think one of the really unique things about tech. And there, I mean, I meet so many people who do not have a degree, but are either working for great companies or building amazing things. Yeah. And so I do think tech in that sense is really cool because a lot of the times people want to see what you've built. Yeah. They want you to, they want to see, what code have you contributed to the community? How are you also involved? And so there are ways that in in other senses, like if you are trying to go and be a doctor, you cannot yeah, just, you, really, you can't you just really like can't. be like, this is all the surgeries I've done, or this is how I it's feel. like, how you did know? you do the surgeries? Exactly. Like, that's you a need, bit suspicious. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's like, why are you cutting people open? Can you go get a degree? But yeah. it's like with tech, it's very unique in that way. So. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. And and I love that you mentioned um, the NVIDIA experience because you've currently you're working with um, Voltron, if yes. I'm if I'm not that's mistaken. Right. Yeah. Uh, you've worked yeah. with NVIDIA, like you mentioned, which is a huge company. Yes. Uh, I'm sure all the gamers would know about NVIDIA. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Python Software Foundation. Um, yes. So what I'm gonna ask you, and this is maybe like two questions in one, so you can split it um, whichever way you want. Mm -hmm. um, do you work at these companies in like a remote capacity or uh, are you actually going there uh, specifically? So I work remotely. I've only yeah. ever worked remotely, which is just like even from before. From Zim? Yeah, I've only worked remotely from Zim. That has yeah. been my only experience in a professional capacity, which is such a privilege, I think, because I would say that remote work in Zim can be hard to come by because of yeah. several things. Um, I think we don't have as many systems set up to make people successful when they're doing remote work, but I think that's improving now over yeah. time. Um, but yeah, I've always worked remotely. When I joined with NVIDIA, they hired me remotely and you know I it, I was starting out with them as an intern and their goal because they don't have an office in Africa they actually wanted me to move so that I could fully join yeah um and you know moved for a, di a number of different reasons I wanted to try developer advocacy they I also didn't feel like I wanted to move to 
to Canada at the time, which is where they wanted me to move at yeah. NVIDIA. So I moved to Voltron Data, which was also an amazing company with lots of people from NVIDIA there as well. They do a lot of similar work, actually. Okay. And um, here I'm still at Voltron Data. I, I work remotely for them and... Yeah, that's that's just always what I've done in my yeah. in my career. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's another thing that's really um, maybe not specific, uh, but it's really it's more common in in the tech in the tech space, especially mm -hmm. like engineering. I have a lot of uh, friends who I know who are actually working remotely, yeah. but I do wonder. It feels and it might be a terrible assumption on my part, but uh, it feels like there's a bit of a split on that right now in terms of remote work mm. with everything that's happening at Twitter. And exactly. Come back to the office. <laughs> is, is that like a sentiment that's actually shared in like these other companies or it's just like, eh, yeah, it's not I'm, really. Right. I think it depends on the company you're working for. I know Elon Musk has been very vocal about how yeah. he's not pro um, remote, work. remote work, which I just don't understand at all because all of the companies I've been to, everyone has been, like the whole company has been 100% remote, remote in terms of the software engineering department. So even when I was at NVIDIA, our entire department was 100% remote. With people sometimes gathering a around an office, like maybe there's a Toronto office and yeah. there are a couple of people that you know, will sometimes go into the office here and there. Yeah. But I think it's actually becoming the norm for more companies to have remote work be the standard. For the company I work for, it is every single person, including the CEO, works remotely. Yeah. And for me, I actually feel like that makes people more productive in my experience, especially yeah. with software engineering. I just feel like I'm not having to worry about what do I wear today? I'm going to the office. I have the time to drive you lose somewhere. Commuting, uh, <laughs> it's just not, yeah. So remote work is really nice in that yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm I'm also pro remote work. Um in at when I was at TechSim, uh 2019, from the start of 2019 through the end of 2020, my final two years there, we were mm. fully remote as well. And exactly. I think it worked, man. I yeah. yeah I, think it, I think it was a better experience. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I think we saved a lot on on time, but I guess yeah. that's um, that's really that on on remote work. But more interestingly, like you said, um, you had the chance to move to Canada. Um, sure, at this stage in your career, if you wanted to leave Zim, you could leave Zim, uh, but. When I was going through your profile, just uh, listening to other podcasts you've done and reading on other interviews, it feels to me like um, something keeps you coming back to solve problems here at home. And is that something that you can actually put into words? Yeah, I think, you know, I think with them, there's that tension, right, of like, you... Like, I feel so tied to Zimbabwe. I'm a Zimbabwean. I was yeah. born here. I grew up here. I understand. Like, I feel like when I'm at home, I'm at home. I'm understood. Yeah. You know, I feel like when you're outside of the country, <laughs> you're like one black person in a sea of white people. And that's fine as well. But there's just it's just different yeah. as well. And it isn't the same in that sense. And I will say for Zim, there are so many problems that people are facing. There's so much that I think that we as younger people in Zimbabwe can yeah. offer the country in terms of solving problems or providing solutions, like you said. And I want to, I feel like I, I want to be part of a solution yeah. for Zimbabwe because I feel like so many people have helped me along my road growing. And I would love to do the same. At the same time as well, I definitely feel this tension of like, and I don't know, I can't say like, is someone was like, are you gonna be in Zim forever? I don't yeah, know, yeah. you know? I mean, because, fair enough, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like, <laughs> It's also very difficult to be in Zim. It's yeah, extremely difficult. It, I actually wanted to say the same thing is that um, you, that tension you mentioned where you do mm -hmm. want to like add to the narrative, you do want to yeah. solve problems, but like a, a lot of things seem to work against your favor. Um, yeah. Perfect example for me right now, we haven't had power here for the last 
four days. Oh my god. This gosh. is backup power. Exactly. At night, we have no power. <laughs> so it's stuff like that where maybe yeah. um, I'm trying to solve for, for media and access to information, mm -hmm. but I also have to solve for power. I also have to solve yeah. for water. Yes. And it's like, oh my god, like as a founder, like, yo. I only want mm -hmm. to solve for access to information. <laughs> it's so true. It's so, so true. So it's stuff like that that can sometimes yes. then weigh you down in, in yeah. Zen. But I definitely hear what you're saying in terms of um, there being work to do. A hundred percent. And like, that's the thing is that if you are in Zim, you are not just solving X problem. You're solving X, Y, Z yep. problem. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like you sometimes I question even in terms of the environment that's there, like other countries, there's such a vibrant startup community. Yeah. VCs are like throwing money out yeah. everywhere. <laughs> so you it's know? even easier to to do the same things that exactly. you, that you, that you aspire to. Yeah, the community as well in terms of like um, people pushing the limits of technology and stuff is there's a lot more people that are doing that in other countries just yeah. because they have the resources to yeah. be able to do it. And so sometimes that tension is also, am I operating at my highest capacity, right? Yeah. And it's sometimes yeah. because of Zim, because it's like, I also have to, <laughs> my energy is going to figuring out Zesa, yeah. figuring out water, figuring out whatever. That's energy yeah. that is taking yeah. away You're from your highest. In, in so many different Yeah, uh, so it's one of those things where there's always going to be a tension, but it's Zimbabwe is a beautiful place. <laughs> yeah, interesting <laughs> place, that. interesting place yeah. to be. <laughs> and so let's talk about um, one of these uh, foundations that uh, you, I think, founded is the right term, right? Uh, with mm -hmm. Zimbo Pie. Yes, right. Um, right. When you founded that, um, what problem were you trying to solve? So Zimbo Pie is the organization I mentioned earlier where I wanted to give Zimbabwean girls access to the world of technology, yeah. whether that was just getting them uh, excited about it. So bringing awareness to the fact that, hey, these are the things that people are doing in this world. You can actually do this as well. Yeah. And I also wanted to provide them with like resources, like practically speaking, how can I learn how to code today? I live in Mfakwasi or whatever. Yeah. I don't have a laptop. How do I learn how to code today? And um, wanting to kind of bridge that gap and give opportunities there was, um, yeah, was my heart behind the, yeah. the, company, the organization. <laughs> yeah. And so how long has that been running so far? So I founded Zimbo Pie in 2017. And Ooh, half I, a decade this year? Half a decade, That's but <laughs> but I have for the past I want to say for the past two years since COVID at yeah. least I yeah. have taken a break because I just found it so challenging. There were so many issues that I ran into. It is so difficult to get grant funding, for example, in yep. Zim <laughs> for nonprofit work, and you know even finding, you know. A volunteers who are willing to also come with me together for a nonprofit was very difficult to run. Yeah. And it's something that I'm getting back into now and only now starting to really revive it, but taking a different strategy because when I founded it, I think I was just trying to, I, I think I was trying to solve every problem and I was like, this is great. I would just solve poverty yeah. in Zimbabwe. Like, this yeah. is just what I'm going to do. I'm going to Teach the Zimbabwean girls how to code, get them jobs, and that's it. You know, I'm going to fix the country. Yeah. But it's like, it's not just the one problem. You know, like I was saying before in Zim, it's like you are solving for a hundred problems. You know? Yeah, I would, uh, I would assume with, and, and sorry to cut you off, I would assume with, in the context of Zimbo Pie, that it might be something as, as simple as actually getting the girls to an event because maybe they don't actually have like transport, transport money. money. Yeah. Like you exactly. said, laptops and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Manage yeah. to get the laptops, but it's like, you know, where are they going to get internet connection? Manage to get internet connection. Yep. <laughs> Zessa is now acting up. <laughs> you know, there's just so many issues here that you like just to get started. It's quite difficult it's to quite difficult, have yeah. the infrastructure for that. So, planning to do to start again but on a smaller scale yeah 
and um, trying to do a bit more one-on-one -on -one mentoring and seeing if I can find something that will work with that and then scaling that over time because before we were doing like 60 girls at a time and that's and that was yeah because that's I remember <laughs> was, that was the impact hub day isn't it I yes, remember coming exactly. to one event yeah. yeah it was packed TechZim was a great supporter <laughs> you were there I remember seeing you there yeah, yeah. it was packed it, it was packed so I can imagine yes. Yes. <laughs> managing to I think that is actually one of um, the the most difficult things in the context of Zim is mm. um uh, scaling the impact, uh, yeah. it, it gets pretty costly. It it mm -hmm. gets pretty difficult. Even if you have the the funding, um, the logistics are still quite. Yeah. It's it's a sure. job. It is a it's full a, time a job. job. Yeah, is it's how like I describe it. A hundred percent. It's like this is someone's job for sure. One of the one of the interesting things that's actually happened in in your career uh, thus far is that you are the first African to hold a seat um, on the Python Software Foundation Board. Right, exactly. Um, congratulations on that. Thank you. <laughs> what uh, problem is the Python Software Foundation solving? And maybe how did that opportunity come about for you? Because uh, that's particularly interesting because uh, a recurring theme in your careers is that, uh, in your career is that, um, the things, the positions you find yourself, I always look at it and I'm like, wow, this is so cool. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, when that was announced, I was like, yo, this is mind-blowing. Um, when you worked at NVIDIA again, I was like, what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> how, does, how do these things happen for, for Marlene? <laughs> yeah. How do these opportunities come about for you? And then maybe you can go into what uh, the problem's actually being solved by the Python Software Foundation. Right, so I... In terms of how these opportunities come about, it's so like I think it's just like I, I think it's God. Honestly, <laughs> some like a big part of that is like I really feel like I've gotten so lucky in so many instances um, because some of the opportunities I am just like I have no idea how this the timing came correctly for this. Yeah. But I, you know, in, even with the PSF opportunity. Some of the things that were in there as well was like just being open to taking risks. So when I was starting, I was working on Zimbo Pi at the time. Yeah. Um, this was several years ago when I joined the board, and you know I was just starting Zimbo Pi. You know, was reaching out to international people because the great, the amazing thing as well is having that exposure beforehand for school. Yeah. going outside of the country and being able to see that okay actually like it's normal people that live in the u.s <laughs> and it's normal people that yeah, are like that on the boards of these companies these that are doing these amazing <laughs> it's actually normal people yeah. you know and i think that was a really good experience for me because i then was more comfortable reaching out to people and connected with a bunch of people from the international python community so for the PSF, I had connected to a lady called Lorena Mesa, and she yeah. was already on the board. And she knew that I was doing um, nonprofit work with Zimbo Pi and had volunteered for one of our events. And she encouraged me to run. And I remember when I was looking at the people that were running for the board that year, yeah. it was like <laughs> people from Google. There was like someone from it, from Disney that was running. And I'm just like, the I'm imposter just, syndrome exactly. Was I'm in Zimbabwe. <laughs> I'm barely making it here. And so I, but I decided, you know, there's nothing I'm going to lose. Let me just go ahead and give it a try. Yeah. So I did. And I put my, my, I, I put my nomination in and said, you know, I'd like to run. And the community voted me in. And I thought that was a huge turning point for me in my career. Yeah. And I definitely think one of the big things there I learned, one of the lessons that I learned is that like, even if something seems out of your reach, just go ahead just and go try for it. <laughs> for it. Try it. You yeah, know? yeah. So that was a big part of, of that yeah. story. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really do like that because <laughs> uh, a bit of a similar story, but maybe not on that scale. Um, one of the first grants we won in 2021 mm. 
was for a, a competition that we, we just didn't fit in any of the categories. Right. But I just went. <laughs> yeah. I showed up, I pitched, and yeah, we won. We got, yeah, we got some funding amazing. that actually helped us uh, improve our equipment and stuff like that. Exactly. And just like, hey, just show up. <laughs> yeah, it's literally just the showing up. And it's like, you can be so nervous about it, but it's yeah. such a big thing. Like yeah. sometimes people will just honor the fact that you've just shown up. And, and so it's... Yeah, yeah it will work out. Really <laughs> <that>. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, given that you, you mentioned uh, the, the exposure you mentioned is... Mm -hmm. um, I'm always fascinated by that. Um, as someone who's predominantly been in Zim uh, for most of their life, um, mm -hmm. one of the things I've always wondered is... Um, you've been exposed to the U.S., I think, mm -hmm. and a number of other countries where you go and speak. And um, my question there would be, um, in I don't is, is first world is first world like politically correct? Is that the term we're using now? Uh, or? I, I think th we call it the global north these days. <laughs> I think there's the global let's, north and then there's the global south. So, let's yeah. go with that. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> you've worked in, in, these, um, uh, in the global north, uh, yeah. or at least in these places where tech is at its cutting edge. Exactly. Um, what do you think is the difference between these places and, and Zimbabwe? Um, and what are the... What's the best way to phrase this? Um, what would you take in Zimbabwe that's missing there? And what mm. would you take from there that's missing here? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, you know, I do think that just by, I think that, for example, Zimbabwe, we gained our independence, what, 1980? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is just like a few years ago. It's actually 42. not that, yeah, it's yeah. not that long ago. Yeah. And so we are just coming out to a place where we are getting stable as a, we're quite young as a country, I yeah. would say. Yeah. And I actually think people, a lot of people downplay the impact of colonization on a country, on the people, on a mindset even. Yeah. And the way that tick, there was just a season, I think that tick just like, you know, accelerated country's growth and yeah. the problem is that we were not able to access or tap into that because we were colonized yeah. <laughs> in those in those periods of time and so i do think that that has made a huge difference and it's something that i feel like impacts where we are today yeah um but at the same time i also think that you know just being in those environments there are things that like because they've been in this in this space where they have lots of resources and things like that. Like, for example, when I was going to university, I was yeah. thinking to myself, I just want to go and get a good job. You know, I just want my parents to be proud of me. I yeah. just want to be a good person. So I'm just going to go and be a doctor, yeah. you know. <laughs> and I think a lot of people are approaching, approaching it. that, their career yeah. that way. But I think in, or people are just trying to survive, trying to make money and things like that to get forward. What I found in some of these other countries is that people actually like do things that interest them. And yeah. they also do things that <laughs> <laughs> they feel will like create like global impact or things like that. So like, yeah. you know, I've met so many people who are studying the most obscure Quantum <laughs> physics, something that is also like, what are you actually going to yeah, do? What's that guy? And I suppose exactly the African question would be, why would you study? Why that? are you going to study <laughs> Where's the quantum? Opportunity yeah. Afterwards? <laughs> what, how is that going to make you money? How are you going to, you know, how, how is that going to, going to contribute to our lives? <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just literally one of those things where we just are still developing that mindset. I think of understanding that hey like i can have real world impact and i can do things that actually matter in the world that yeah. i enjoy that i feel like um can add to that but that also comes that i think is also an expression of freedom that comes from yeah. also being economically well off and sometimes when you are not economically <laughs> well off you it's, are it's not able tricky. to you think don't have about those that. choices yeah yeah so <laughs> It's definitely something, but I will say that I think yeah. that in Zim, 
we do like one of the things is like Zimbabwean people. I don't think I've met people as driven as like, I just think Zimbabweans just have like a very high level of intelligence, just like yeah. baseline. Yeah. And I just have consistently seen that I've consistently gone to places and been shocked to be like, Oh, there's a Zimbabwean here. <laughs> They're just running this whole place. It's Zimbabwean, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and I think just baseline, we have just a natural grit a natural intelligence that if we had the resources around us, I feel like we would just do incredible things. Yeah. So that's one thing. I also think there's also more of a, I think Zimbabweans are also more in tune with like um, family culture and things like that in a way that I don't see necessarily in the US. It's very like, or like for example, if yeah. I have personal time off as Zimbabwean, I'm going to take my personal time off. You know, if you give me 30 days to take time off, <laughs> I'm going to take the 30 days yeah. off and I'm going to rest, you know. But I feel like in the U.S. sometimes there is like a pressure. Just naturally people are on this spinning wheel and it's hard for them to get off of that and feel okay. Yeah. And I do think that's something that I wish was in some of these company, in these companies or in this world as well as just yeah. that. Um, ability to rest as well so yeah. yeah no it's been great i think that is essentially everything i i really wanted to to ask you thank you I so much i didn't actually tell you what the PSF does do you want me to oh tell yeah you like uh what the python no, software what P, yeah what python okay. software foundation uh the mandate is for you guys there. right but the goal of the psf <laughs> is um the goal of the psf is to advance the Python programming language and yeah. to promote the growth of an international community. So one of the goals is to make sure that Python is being spread across the world, that people have access to resources as well. Yeah. And so that was a big part of my role there was making sure that we had inclusion even in leadership so that we're advocating for the right resources for people yeah. from who are not from these countries where usually they focus on. Yeah. And so for me, I was really trying to make sure that the African community was included in those conversations yeah. that we are providing. Yeah, because we tend to be, we tend to be <laughs> just, on the periphery. Yeah, it's like we're, to <laughs> Ooh, sorry. No, it's it's like we're talking about technology and it's like Africa is just not, not there. on the table. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely one of the things. I just stepped down from the board of directors, yeah. but I've also just joined another board, the other oh. association of computing machinery, which is behind the Turing Award. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Turing Award. No, no, maybe let's, yeah, maybe we can actually speak on, on that briefly. Um, sure. What are, you, what are you guys doing there? So the and, and what's your role in particular? Right, so I just joined the ACM board, and the yeah. ACM is one of the oldest computing associations in the world. It's probably the oldest. Yeah. And so the Turing Award is like an award they give to people in that field who are making, it's like I would say the Nobel Peace Prize of like that field. Of, like computing. <laughs> exactly, of computing yeah. and, and things like that. Um, but um, it's, they give a lot of, they have a lot of different awards or different groups that support people who are in the computing space. Yeah. And so I am joining as the vice chair of their yeah. practitioner board, which is very exciting. <laughs> And yeah, I, I, I have just joined, so I don't have much feedback in terms yeah. of what we've actually done. Yeah. But we're actually <laughs> wanting to do more. One of the reasons they brought me onto the board is because they're wanting to do more things in Africa and to provide more access to like software resources and to networks even. Like yeah. your network is so important. And so creating a network as well that connects um, African people to the global community as well is a big thing that that they want to do. Yeah, I yeah. I love that. I love that for for selfish reasons because <laughs> <laughs> for me one of the most irritating things is when um, features roll out and mm. they just don't come to us. And yeah. Like, what? Yeah. And Why? So, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. if you're furthering my cause somehow. Exactly. <laughs> hopefully. I, I stand behind you. Yes. <laughs> No, but thank you so much for, for sparing the time. Uh, I'm sure this will help like a lot of people. And yeah, proud of the work that you're doing. 
Thank you. Hopefully, Thank you for having me. <laughs> you're welcome. Hopefully you can plug us with some of some other interesting developers in Zim so that we can yeah, we can just continue exactly. to 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 spread the knowledge and different experiences from that field as well. A hundred percent. Thank you so much, Marlene. No problem.